Good evening, everyone, and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. As you probably noticed, I am not Dr. Holm. I'm Dr. Deborah Johnston. I practice family medicine at the Avera Medical Group in Brookings. Rick is traveling this week, but was kind enough to ask me to fill in for him during his absence. How many times do your conversations with friends and coworkers include a reference to stress? Most of the time, we deal with it and move on. But for a variety of reasons, occasionally stress stays with us and builds. If this continues, we may reach a level of stress that could be considered burnout, where we are pushed to a point that dramatically impacts our quality of life. Tonight, we will answer as many of your questions as we can about stress and burnout. Call in your questions at 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email. Tonight, I'm joined here in the studio by my partner, Dr. Jill Cruz of the Brookings Health System, and via Skype, we are really pleased to welcome Dr. Amit Sood of the Mayo Clinic. Amit, could you fill us in a little bit? Tell us how you came to be interested in this area of practice. Yeah, sure. Good evening. I, I came to the U.S. about 20 years ago in 1995 uh, after having studied medicine for about 10 years uh, overseas in India. Uh, so in my first year of medical school, actually, we had a chemical spill in my hometown that, uh, that killed about 10,000 people. So by the time I came to U.S., having seen a lot of stress from malnutrition and infections and poverty, I thought I was going to come to Disneyland of the world. I thought everybody here will be very happy. I thought as a child here, you grow up in Disneyland, you play slots in Las Vegas when you grow up and you retire in Florida playing bingo. I thought that is what is American life. I was seeing too many movies. But when I came here and I saw the amount of stress here, like any other part of the world, it sort of surprised and shocked me. I thought I was going to go become an oncologist but I, I thought maybe I should study this and try to understand why everybody uh, cannot learn. Why can't we be, we be happy when we really want to be happy? There must be some neural predisposition. So I came across some, some remarkable insights after studying uh, work that had been done by a lot of scientists. So I put that all together to start helping patients and, and slowly a program emerged. And so now this is my passion for life. That is just fantastic. What an incredible gift to offer the world. And uh, Jill, tell us a little bit about how you came to be involved in this. Well, um, like many doctors, there is rampant stress and burnout in our careers. And when I was in my first job, I was pregnant with my second child, uh, on call every fourth night running the ER and I was mentally exhausted, physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted. And when I went on maternity leave, I said, I can't go back to work the way I left. I won't be practicing medicine anymore because I just didn't enjoy it. I didn't love it. I was angry and frustrated and tired and I just wanted to feel better. So I spent my maternity leave learning about stress and burnout. I found that what I was feeling had a name and it was common and no one talked about it. And so from that, I started learning about it and actually working with a physician who specifically has his career of working with other doctors who have been burned out and are exhausted and having a hard time dealing with stress because we're taught to take care of other people. We're never taught how to take care of ourselves. So. He gave me lots of resources and tools and ways to find the joy and love of medicine again and find out what I needed to do to be able to give back to my patients and be a better doctor. Um, and out of that, I decided that, you know, I can't be the only one experiencing this. I can't be the only one who's been burned out or stressed and felt like I didn't have the tools or the resources to deal with it well. So. I said, you know, can I introduce Dr. Dijkstrom to other people at Avera? And out of that, we've had several conversations, several meetings, and we've created what's called the Avera Light Program, which is a program for dealing with physician and nurse practitioner and PA stress and burnout, trying first to prevent it, and then if it's there, finding ways to treat it and make um, physicians be happy to be treating patients again. 
Um, LIGHTS are an acronym for what we hope the goals of the program are, which is live, improve, grow, heal, treat. So um, I've been working at spreading the light to all of Avera, and uh, we've actually been getting some national attention for this with other hospital and health systems saying, oh my gosh, what are you guys doing? It's amazing. We need this. How can we do what you're doing? So we've been very excited to help spread the light and get doctors enjoying their practice again instead of suffering through because when you're not there and present, you're not any good for your patient. It's so powerful too to have that. One of the things you had mentioned was um, recognizing that this had a name, that this was something that other people experienced. I think that one of the hardest things about stress is how isolated that people start feeling. What's, what's your perspective on that, Dr. Dr. Sood? Yeah, stress is uh, uh, quite a bit related to uh, spending too much time inside your head. Uh, so for example, uh, if you have read a book, you read half a page, you say, what was I reading? Uh, and then you go back and start again. I don't know if that has ever happened to you. Uh, and and if, if it did, then that means you were mind wandering at that time. And uh, what research shows is we spend about 80 percent, 50 to 80 percent of the time with a wandering attention, where at that time we are going through all the open files, all the unresolved issues in our head. And so when we are inside our, of our head, uh, then we are not connected with the world outside us. And actually, by the way, inside your head is not where party is happening. Party is happening outside your head. So, uh, so, uh, and so, so that loneliness, that perceived loneliness is tremendously stress producing. It is as bad as smoking or diabetes for your heart risk and stroke risk and for even early, early death. So stress is isolating. You lose that sense of vitality and connection with yourself. Your self-worth goes down. You don't want to engage with life. You feel like you're burnt out. You're depleted. And, and uh, so it sort of uh, snowballs because you feel alone, which leads to more stress. More stress leads to you're choosing to be more alone. And, and people get stuck there, unfortunately. But, but the good news is there's a way out. I, I think that one of the things that you mentioned is incredibly important to, to point out to people, and that's that stress and these emotional things take a very physical toll on our bodies. Um, they increase the risk of medical illness, of heart attacks and strokes and premature death. And so often I, I hear people want to minimize what they're going through and the impact that that has. Um, and we really need to change that mindset. That's really important. And I think one of the important things about teaching physicians to take it seriously in ourselves is if we don't take it seriously in ourselves, then we're not going to take it as seriously as we should in our patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one of the hallmarks of burnout is actually called compassion fatigue, where you just don't have any energy to care and what a terrible thing to have a doctor that doesn't care. Yeah, a doctor that's too tired to too, care. Too tired to care, too tired to listen. Yeah. There are many benefits to having a pet in all stages of our lives. The Brookings Humane Society has a Senior for Seniors program to help the elderly battle stress and burnout. The goal of the Seniors to Seniors program is just to place wonderful animals with wonderful people. Um, senior animals can be harder to adopt out, not always, but sometimes, um, and, and they're just wonderful animals that are in need of a second chance. And sometimes, especially for, for older humans, it's nice to get an, an older animal. You can see how big they are. You don't have to wonder. Uh, you know, how big they're going to get or what their personality is going to be like once they get older. What you see is what you get. It's especially nice if you don't have the patience. I don't have the patience for potty training and chewing and um, you know, kittens knocking pictures off the walls and just the, the high energy youth stage of puppies and kittens. Um, they can still be wonderful companions. Uh, like Winnie here would still love to go for a walk, but she doesn't have to be jogged five miles a day like one of my dogs. Just a really nice way to place 
wonderful animals that are, are usually already house trained, already um, worked through all those young issues with people who, who want a, a pet, a companion, someone to spend their day with. There's a lot of research on animals reducing stress, whether it's just because you have a reason to get up and go for a walk or uh, just the act of petting a dog or a cat can lower stress levels in your body. Having a companion, someone you can talk to, someone you can walk with, someone you can spend your day with, a reason to have a routine. When my grandfather had a dog, uh, it was someone that got him out walking every day and it made him get up and make sure the dog was fed and had water and went for his walk and, and just keeping him active and on task and kind of alert. He was, it, it really made a difference for grandpa to have his dog to j just keep him, keep him moving and keep him active. You know, my dad loves to walk his dog. It, it, you know, I don't think my dad would walk nearly as much if he didn't have a, have a dog keeping him out there. Cats too. Uh, cats, are, cats are wonderful companions. Just someone to sit on the couch with you, someone to pet, someone to spend time with. You can feel your stress dripping away when you're petting an animal. There's just something about a dog coming over and laying their head on your lap or, or a cat just spending time with you. We actually go up on campus during finals week and provide stress relief to the students. We bring dogs and cats and um, go up there and some students cry, some students are so happy. You know, it's just, there's something magical about animals <laughs> that, that makes you feel better. So basically, yeah, it's coming in and meeting them and, and, and picking out which animal is the right match for your lifestyle and your living situation. And then we have a very brief um, application process and then the, uh, we actually reduce the adoption fees for adult animals. And if a senior human adopts a senior animal, it's a free will donation. Uh, we, we really strive to place animals in, in those loving homes and, and senior humans and senior animals can be a really great match. If you would like to assist the Brookings Humane Society or really any shelter, they are always looking for donated supplies, volunteers, and in our Humane Society, people to foster pets before they go to their permanent home. You can like their page on Facebook to get updates on available animals. And I, I love that clip. I, I just love that clip. All of my critters have been Humane Society animals, and I'm a big pet person. And I can remember suggesting to patients, even very early in my career as a resident, you know, you should, you should get a dog. That dog will get you out for a walk. And this was um, early days and before a lot of the research came out. But it it's, just makes common sense. And I think it's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, our dog is a wonderful member of our family and sometimes you just need a hug from someone who's that you can talk to and won't say anything back. That's <laughs> so. right. Uh, how about I, you, Dad? I remember, I remember actually, I, I remember seeing this 80-year-old woman who had lost her husband. She was very depressed and she came to see me in the clinic. And after talking to her, uh, I wrote her a prescription, and she was surprised on the on the prescription I wrote, adopt a pet. <laughs> so, so she went, she took it. I didn't know what would happen. So she took it seriously. She went home. She adopted a puppy. And six months later, I have my nurse. You know, she knocked at my door. I was with a patient. She said, No, you have to come out. You have to come out and see this. You know, say Mrs. Johnson. And so I come out. And there's this same lady, all giggles with that pet in her, you know, lap. And and I said, Oh my gosh, you, you know. And she said it worked. Uh, and she gave me my prescription back. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that that's a beautiful memory. I think we should have, we should not only prescribe, you, you know, the, these antidepressants or psychotherapy and all of that, we should also prescribe to people to adopt pets. There's something called biophilia. We humans, whenever we are surrounded by life, we feel happy and we feel good. So, so, so pets, pets are phenomenal. Love pets. I, I think that uh, we were talking a little bit about the um, the emotional disconnect that people get and I think that walking your dog 
is a wonderful way to connect with other people because there's so many times, I know when I'm out with my children, um, one of my children is terribly shy, but boy, if there's a dog involved, she will stop just about anybody to ask if she can pet that dog. She just is very much an animal lover and um, it's a wonderful way to make connections with the community too. So. It's the easiest icebreaker in the world, you know. Yes, it is. Ask what's the dog's name or what breed is it, and all of a sudden you can make a new friend. That's right. That's right. So sometimes I sometimes I tell uh, my patients when you get back home, uh, treat your family like your dog treats you. You know, show that excitement when your loved ones come back home, uh, because kids, you know, one of the most important things kids want in their parents and grandparents is for them to light up when they see them. Yes. And that is that is what I'm sure you remember about your childhood. So you, know, you can gift it to them. And that is what dogs teach us. Uh, even if you have met them half an hour ago, you go to the, the grocery store, buy something, come back, they'll treat you as if they haven't seen you for months. And I, I believe in, in at least some way that is how we should treat each other. Yeah. Unconditional love and acceptance. It's a, it's a wonderful thing wonderful thing. <clears throat> so one of the questions that's come through for us here um, is it seems many people view physical and mental problems in different realms. How do you get your patients to see mental illnesses in the same light as physical ones? Uh, Amit, can we, can we get your perspective on that? Absolutely. So I draw uh, uh, an image for them and, and every single medical condition, be it high blood pressure or be it, be it some form of cancer or even trauma, uh, they have two components. They have a biological component and a psychological component. So, so you have to address both in most medical conditions. Now, there was a time, maybe 50 years ago, we would call, you know, that if you're stressed, it's not real. If you have osteoporosis, that's real. Or if you have heart attack, that is real. What we have now come to realize is that people who have stress, they have a particular pattern of their brain that lights up. They have a particular expression of genes in their, in their genetic makeup. They have a particular changes in blood profile, their cortisol level, their adrenaline level. They have uh, their, their blood vessels, their ECG changes, physical, uh, show some specific changes. So, so now we are at a point where we have recognized that these are actually tangible physical changes happening. And instead of connecting stress to mind, we have connected stress to brain. And nobody can argue with keeping your brain healthy or have brain showing, uh, nobody says that brain is not a physical structure. So that, that debate, I think we should not have. We should not judge people who are stressed. We should consider stress as a real issue. And, and we should focus on healing and helping rather than judging. The worst thing we can do to somebody who is stressed is just judging it, that you're faking it or it is not real. I like to, uh, to use the example to people when we're talking about stress or, or depression or anxiety or other um, what we call mental health issues. You know, there was a time in our society where we didn't think seizures were real either, where we couldn't see them, we couldn't, um, couldn't identify what the problem was, so we didn't think they were real. And I think that as our technologies have gotten better and more sensitive and um, we're able to look inside the body in better ways, we're just going to be increasingly able to see the changes that these stresses um, wreak on the body and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do away with some of this um, false dichotomy. So. What's, what are your thoughts there, Jill? Um, I kind of tell my patients the same thing. I said, you would never accuse a diabetic of being weak because their pancreas isn't producing insulin. So why would I accuse someone of being weak because they're depressed, because there's something wrong with the neurotransmitters? You know, it, it seems ridiculous. Yeah. So you try to normalize it and you try to explain that, yes, this is medical and there's something we can do about it. There, there must be something about that because I often uh, will tell people, yeah, and you should just talk yourself out of needing your insulin too, so there must be something about that uh, particular 
example. So, um, what, uh, which diseases do we see most commonly associated with stress? What do, what, are your, what do you see in your practice, Jill? Definitely a lot of anxiety disorders, panic attacks, um, afraid of being out in public or afraid of doing presentations, you know, the school projects. Um, definitely a lot of depression. And then that isolation can lead to other things such as alcoholism or, you know, things where you're finding ways to self-medicate that aren't healthy. Yeah, very much. I see a lot of self-medication. Mm -hmm. And Amit, what, what diseases do you see that you can directly relate back to your patient's stress? Sure, so some of the psychological things that uh, Jill was mentioning, neurological conditions like, you know, inability to focus, uh, sleep issues, um, uh, sometimes people even have tingling paresthesias. Then cardiac conditions, people have palpitations when they have stress, uh, their blood pressure goes up, their risk of heart attack goes up. Uh, uh, then a lot of GI symptoms like heartburn, uh, GI upset, uh, indigestion, uh, sometimes constipation, sometimes diarrhea, uh, general predisposition towards inflammation um, and, uh, uh, you know, hair loss, though, I, I, you know, I think I'm more stressed because of losing hair, not because uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I'm not losing hair because of stress. Uh, so anyway, so hair loss, even increased risk of cancer in some situations can happen. So you pick uh, index of any medical book, all the diagnoses there are predisposed to by chronic stress. One of the questions that came through was about the association with blood sugars and stress, particularly in diabetics. Um, and that's definitely something that I've seen. I, I hear that over and over again with my patients. Um, and I see it in their, their results that they bring in for me. It, it, I assume you see the same thing. Definitely. And it, and it can be any stress, stress of illness. Yep. You know, if you have a fever, your blood sugars can go out of whack. So any yep. stress on the body, mental or or physical. or physical, but definitely that mental stress will do it too. It's just a little harder to track than it is with the physical stress. So. Some of the ways that we can look at uh, dealing with that stress, volunteering and exercise can help reduce stress. And this can be especially important to those of us like uh, Dr. Sood and uh, Dr. Cruz and myself who have jobs that put us under significant stress and maybe don't let us get a lot of exercise in our day-to-day -day routine. Our shifts are not un, uh, atypical. Most places I've ever been, um, the critical care shifts are 12-hour shifts or 24-hour um, on-call, believe it or not. When I was a fellow, we took over the ICU on Monday morning and we were on call until the following Monday. So we did seven straight days from five in the morning until probably seven at night and then we would sleep for a while and try to get home and get some sleep and then be back at it the next day. It was actually pretty crazy. Being in the intensive care unit or being in the EICU where I'm monitoring hospitals all over a six state region is uh, like drinking out of a fire hose. I mean, this can be quiet sometimes, but that's not the usual situation. The usual situation is it just comes at you from the time you walk through the door until the time you leave. So you have to have some way to uh, decompress so during work, actually, you have to, you know, take a deep breath and sort of step out of the unit periodically when you can, just to sit down and grab something to, to eat or take a walk a little bit. Because 12 hours, you know, drinking out of a fire hose, patient after patient after patient, uh, you, you know, you got to take a break. Um, if you don't take a break, actually, you get to the point where you're not really useful to anybody. Um, plus, you lose, you, you know, you lose fun in your life. So I've always thought you have to have outlets and not just sort of little passive outlets, but things you're really passionate about, you know, that you really care about, that, that you look forward to. I think that's, the, I think that's really the key. Um, so for example, when I'm in the ICU, I'm working hard, but if it's a sunny day and I know my bike's in the hallway and when I finish my shift and I look out the window and it's not raining, I'm, I'm thinking about that as well. I mean, it helps me get through the day, so. So you have to do things. I, I ride a bike a lot, actually. Three years ago, rode 630 miles from Sioux Falls over to South Bend, Indiana to help raise money for this organization. And that was a 630 miles in six days deal. And then last year, a friend of mine and I did another fundraiser. We rode five of the biggest climbs in, in Colorado. 
that part of it's adventure. Uh, and now I'll be climbing on this bike again and trying to raise additional money to help finish building this hospital in Ecuador. And this one, this one might be a little crazy. This one we're going to ride from the Mexican border to the Canadian border um, along the Continental Divide. And we'll cross the Continental Divide 34 times between the time we leave Mexico and hopefully make it to the north. The point is that um, it's got to be something you really love and you like training for, you like doing. Why are, are my wife and I involved with this organization in Ecuador? Why do we ride bikes? But more specifically, this kind of work that we do in Ecuador. And I always tell people because I'm selfish. I mean, I really say that to people. They say, why do you do this? And I say, because I'm selfish. Because I get back, we get back so much more. I know this is what people always say, but it turns out that it's absolutely true. My life is so much richer because of the people that I know from biking and the people that I know from Ecuador, uh, I, I can't even quantify it. So the answer is why do I do it? What do I get out? It, it provides a great, great deal of personal satisfaction and, um, and uh, sense of well-being. I just think to stay healthy and to stay useful and to stay, um, to stay focused and centered, you have to have some way to disconnect from the intense work that you do. So we talked a little earlier about volunteering and that social connection, that human connection. But we haven't talked much about exercise and how important that is in managing stress. Well, definitely exercising is a wonderful way, one, to get out of your head because you, know, you just get into the rhythm of what you're doing with the exercise and focusing on what you're doing. And that can be wonderfully freeing. Um, like Dr. Sood was saying, get out of your brain. <laughs> get out of your brain and focus on your body and, and get moving and that can help so much now you're not going to exercise your way out of depression, but it definitely will help boost your mood and boost those natural endorphins and those natural feel-good chemicals. Yeah. So, you know, they talk about a runner's high. They're not joking. It really does give you that sense of um, feeling great. Uh, although I've never personally run long or fast enough to experience <laughs> it myself, I'm told it's a wonderful thing when it happens. So maybe we can find someone after the marathon or 5K and and ask them. And ask them if they did. I always like to tell people that uh, you exercise and burn off all those stress hormones and that, that seems to resonate with people. But you know, one of the reasons, Dr. Sue, that I, I was so excited to have you join us is because you had such a wonderful set of other stress management um, perspectives that you presented at the, the conference that Dr. Cruz and I were at. And I think this would be a wonderful uh, tie-in to some of these things, if you could share that with us again. Sure. Um, so you have, you have two hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, basically, uh, uh, Deborah and Jill, what I realized uh, after e years of studying was that our brain was designed for survival and safety. Our brain was not designed for peace and happiness. And uh, so our brain prioritizes that. We spend a lot of time mind wandering. Uh, we uh, experience, we, we inflate the bad and discount the good. For example, if you got promoted, how long does the joy of promotion last? You would say maybe two hours. But if you were passed over for promotion, how long does the sorrow or frustration last? It's a much longer time, perhaps a lifetime. So that is how our brain is designed. So we have to find ways to overcome our neural predispositions because the reality is even if your dow jones industrial average went to 50000 tomorrow and everybody had you know a lot of money even then the stress is not going to go away we will still be somewhat miserable so we have to work with these imperfections in the brain so uh, what i do is i help people develop a more intentional attention for example when people wake up in the morning instead of you know, starting with what should I do, what should I dread, I, I really suggest that you wake up thinking about five people in your life you're grateful for, rather than, uh, rather than thinking about what should I do, what should I dread. During the day, uh, uh, 
mindfully walk around for five minutes, just noticing the beautiful world around you. And when you get back home at six o'clock in the evening, instead of getting busy immediately improving your family, meet them as if they are your long lost friend, that as if you have not seen them for a long time. And, and a three minute rule that we have is do not try to improve anybody for the first three minutes when you reach home. So these are some, uh, these are a few practices that we call joyful attention. The other group of practices are uh, kind attention, where when you see people, random people, we have this instinct of you know sizing up people or judging them very quickly, uh, and that is not very adaptive. So what we invite people is to do is that when you see people, because everybody is really struggling, you recognize that, and your instinct then is to wish people silently well or send a silent good wish of some kind. And as you were saying, when you're helping others, when you're wishing others well, you feel good about yourself. And then there are some uh, some core practices to align your thinking with higher order principles. And we have five practices, gratitude, compassion, acceptance, meaning, and forgiveness. And we have days divided for them. So Mondays are our days of gratitude, Tuesdays of compassion, Wednesdays of acceptance, Thursdays of higher meaning, and Fridays of forgiveness. Recognize that we only ask you to forgive on Friday. You don't have to forgive the entire week in our program. <laughs> That's good, because that's awfully hard for a lot of people. That's a, that's a higher order uh, accomplishment, I think. So, um, One of the things that I hear sometimes that I'd be really interested to hear your two perspectives on, um, the statement, stress is just stress. It's how you deal with it that matters. What, what do you think about that? Do you think that stress can be healthy and stress can be hurtful? Well, there definitely is a tipping point uh, where stress can be what motivates you to study for the test at the last minute that you've been putting off and procrastinating. Uh, but if you pull an all-nighter and then you're too exhausted to do all on the test the next morning, you know, there is that point of diminishing returns. So stress can be a powerful motivator um, right alongside with fear. And stress can also be exhausting. So it, it's good in short, small bursts, um, but you know it, it's kind of like running your motorcycle flat out in first gear. It's not designed to do that. You're going to burn up your motor. So you need to shift every once in a while and, and change gears and find ways to deal with things. So to be on the same level with stress all the time, you know, constantly dealing with it at high levels is not good. Emma, what do you think the difference between stress and fear is? Well, uh, stre first of all, if I may just say, so stress is load capacity imbalance. So whenever the load is high and capacity is low, you, you feel more stress. So either you can enhance capacity or decrease the load. Like today I saw a patient who has uh, who lost her wife and her two daughters in a car accident. I mean, how can I say stress is stress? This person is going through tremendous adversity in life. And actually, unfortunately, we see a, a lot of those patients uh, at Mayo and, 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 and pretty much at many medical centers. So, so life's challenges are real. Uh, so coming back to this question, stress versus uh, fear. Stress is your so anxiety is when, when, when you're just feeling anxious and nervous without any good tangible reason many times. Stress is when you have a reason, when you're struggling with what is. Uh, when you are struggling with, with what is, what was, or what might be. Uh, and that is what is stress. Uh, Fear is when you are uh, worrying about uh, an adverse outcome in the future. So stress can be about the past or present. Fear is about future of how things might happen. And, and you, are, you are fearful or concerned about a certain, certain outcome that is undesirable. So, so stress can be that of past, present, or future. Fear is, is always of the future. I, I love well, I, I don't love it, but I think your example of the, the woman who has lost these people who are so important in her life is so important because we see that. We see people who have just endured these un, unimaginable tragedies, and um, I, we need to have more compassion. And I think in our society, we are so ready to tell people, well, it's been a month, aren't you over that yet? 
And no, you're, you're not. And you're not going to be over that. You're not going to be over that next month or the month after or next year. You just need to find a way to make something in your life worthwhile and meaningful um, again. And that's a really hard thing, a really hard thing. When we are on the road to burnout, we may think we don't have time to eat properly and grab whatever is quick. Unfortunately, that is the opposite of what we should be doing. Stress and burnout brings a busy schedule and a tired you. With a busy schedule and sometimes exhaustion, proper or adequate nutrition is not first on the list of things to worry about. Focus on nutrition. When you are busy, you don't always think about nutrition, but rather think more about eating food to keep the hunger away. This can be detrimental to your waistline and also to your health. Missing basic or key nutrients can add stress to your already stressed body. Don't forget your fruits and vegetables along with lean proteins and whole grains. Eat regularly. Eating at least three times daily will allow your body to maintain a stable metabolism and will keep you going. A somewhat typical eating schedule will also help to keep too many added calories at bay. Finally, plan. Planning and pre-preparation can save you time with a busy schedule. Plan meals ahead and make them easy to prepare. This will save you time and allow you and your family to still have a balanced diet amid a busy lifestyle. Boy, nutrition, what, what a great topic is that for managing stress. What's, what's your favorite tip to busy people, stressed people for improving their nutrition? Have a plan. You know, take some time Sunday night and think about what your plan is for the next week rather than going home and having to try to figure out each night right when you walk in the door, okay, now what are we going to eat? If you have the freezer meals or you have a plan or just, just a general idea of what you're going to do, that's one less thing to worry about. So you know, be mindful. It only takes a few minutes to kind of plan out what your week's going to be, and yeah. it'll make a huge dividend. It does. So we've got a whole bunch of questions here that are, are have come in now that we're live. Um, and the first one I'd like to address to you, Amit, um, stress and chronic pain. What's what's the relationship? Oh, uh, it's a it's stress and chronic pain are intimately related. Actually, um, uh, if you look at biologically, uh, emotional hurt is processed by a, an area in the brain called insula, and emotional hurt is processed by the same part of the brain which is processed by physical pain. So, uh, so emotional and physical hurts, brain sees as the same. Emotional hurts worsen physical pain, and physical pain worsens emotional pain. So, so they are, in another study, uh, what we have found is that the pain complex in the brain gets activated when people are feeling excessively stressed. So there is an intimate relationship between uh, between uh, between emotional and physical pain, uh, and uh, brain treats this, uh, both of them very very similarly. Absolutely, I, I we see that every day in our practices. The the more stressed somebody is, the more sensitive they are going to be to pain. The more they're going to experience it. Um, we have a question from a 67 year old woman. Uh, Besides eating and sleeping and nutrition, since we just talked about nutrition, looking for some insider tips on, on improving stress management. Let's say looking for trying to figure out what is causing the stress. Is it a lack of control? And if there is, what do you have control over? Um, you may not have control over, you know, I don't have any control what time my kids get up, but I do have some. Uh, control over whether I have their clothes picked out for the morning rush and you know, whether the, there's already gas in the car. So what things do I have control? And sometimes it takes some creative brainstorming to see what you can do because a lot of times you feel stuck. 
And you may not be, but it may take some out of the box thinking to come up with a creative solution. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Sood, you're, you have an organization actually that is trying to help uh, bring practical everyday tips to people about managing stress and, and improving their overall emotional well-being. Am I recalling, am I interpreting that correctly? Yeah, we have a we have a, a, a little organization called Global Center for Resiliency and Wellbeing, and we are trying to actually reach globally with some of the ideas to help people be happier and have lower stress. Uh, and 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 we're opening centers in multiple parts of the U.S. Uh, to be able to take uh, some of these approaches. To answer your uh, your uh, caller's question, uh, there are a whole host of uh, techniques, skill sets that you can use in addition to diet, exercise, nutrition, and sleep. And the core part is, uh, you know, the ways to be happier and low and have lower stress. Uh, there are three words: connection. Uh, caring and creativity. So the more you connect with people around you, uh, your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, the more you have compassion and caring for others and yourself, and the more creative activities you do, music, artwork, etc., sewing, uh, the lower the stress you will have. Uh, creative ways of lowering load in your life, simplifying your life, delegating things, time management, all of those help with lowering your stress. Good optimal self-care helps with lowering stress. Being grateful for what is right, being compassionate for what is wrong, accepting that some things are not controllable, and finding meaning through adversity, all of those help with stress. And of course, having a lower threshold towards forgiveness. A lot of people find uh, faith-based practices, spiritual practices as stress relieving. Uh, meditation, prayer, guided imagery, yoga, tai chi, all of these practices uh, are helpful for reducing stress. One of the callers called in and, and asked about medications for assisting in dealing with stress. Um, they have a very stressful job and don't think that they have any other options for employment. Uh, what are your, what's your take on medications for stress? Well, I would say I prefer them to be short term. I, I am not a big fan of using anything that's a sedative. Um, it, that basically makes you not care as much about the stress that's going on rather than looking for solutions for it. So I'd say you know finding the, the meditation, finding the breathing, you know, finding ways to deal with it rather than trying to mask it. And a lot of the medications at this point, unfortunately, do a lot of masking. I think certainly stress increases a person's risk for developing clinical depression or anxiety. And those, I think, can respond very well to, to certain medications. I'm very, very slow to use the Valiums or those kinds of things because I, I think they're more harmful than helpful in most of the patients that I see. Um, I'm sure that Dr. Sood's patients are a little bit different than the ones we see in our everyday practice, so his experience may be a little bit different. Um, Dr. Sood, are you, your practice is adults, am I correct about that, or do you see children as well? My, my personal practice is adults, and, and I, I see uh, uh, similar. We see patients who come from all over the world here, but we also see a lot of local patients. And, um, and, and Mayo Clinic has in Rochester 30,000 employees, so they, they need help too. I mean, they have old moms and old dads, and you know, they worry about kids. And so, uh, so you'll be surprised uh, about the similarity between our, our practices, actually. Do you are you aware of research about the differences in uh, the manifestations of stress between children and adults? Well, I don't. I don't help children a lot. I am. I. I do am aware that uh, children depend a lot on the uh, external environment. Uh, in terms of children, need a kind attention from adults to feel good while uh, adults tend to have uh, more an internal disposition, they have more uh, their own traits that manifest as stress. And children tend to internalize, their learning goes down, their focus goes down, they start becoming colicky and all that. There's also 
differences between men and women uh, in terms of uh, how, how we manifest stress. Men uh, classically tend to fight and flight. Women tend to tend and befriend. Hmm. Um, we have a question here about weight and how stress relates to weight management. What's your perspective, Dr. Cruz? Well, I would say it, part of it could be how you're dealing with the stress. If you're stress eating or you know not eating healthy, eating the junk food definitely can add. Um, personally, when I'm stressed, I tend to lose weight because I just stop eating and I lose my appetite. And you know, my mother gets worried when I'm wasting away, and you know, she's like, "What's going on?" You know, so I think it can go either way, and it all depends on if you're eating to deal with it or if you're not eating to deal with it. So, I, I definitely think that stress and emotional um, circumstances have a big role to play in, in weight. And when I counsel patients about uh, weight management, patients that are very stressed are going to have a much harder time in doing that. Um, we have a question about when you should go and talk to your doctor and how to talk to your doctor about your stress. Um, Amit, what, what do you see? What are your thoughts? And, and this really dovetails with when to start medication. So, you know, we all have stress. You know, if you were to an average stress level in America from over a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being minimal, 10 being high is about 5. So, so if you have mild to moderate stress, particularly if it is situational and the situation is going to pass, the clouds are going to go away, then you don't need to. And I often see people who are referred for stress, but when I ask them, they'll say, oh, yeah, I had a, I had a bad meeting and I was stressed for a week and then I'm better now. So I'll say, well, that's fine. You know, this is part of life. You, you don't really need to change much. But when stress starts affecting your functional status in terms of um, if you're... You know, if you get upset, uh, if your uh, car got totaled, I mean, that is fair to get stressed. But if you get upset because there's some spilled milk on the dining table, you know, then there is some imbalance happening. If you're yelling at kids, if you're becoming unkind to your spouse, if you are not able to focus and remember, if you're not, if you're having sleepless nights, if you're losing, you know, obviously, if you're getting towards depression, if you're having panic attacks, uh, if you're losing interest in life, and certainly worse like suicidal ideations and things of that nature. So, uh, so anytime excessive stress is impacting your functionality, that is definitely a threshold at which you should seek help. Absolutely. Jill, we have only got a couple minutes left. Do you have any take home messages? I would say breathe. The biggest thing for stress, I find when I'm stressed, I hold my breath. So sometimes just taking that deep breath to help cleanse and restart and put a pause button on the stress so you can move forward. So don't forget to breathe. Good. Amit, what thoughts do you have? What last uh, minute or two messages do you have for our viewers? Well, be kind to yourself and be kind to others. You know, the, the solution, eventual solution to stress is to not postpone joy and, and look at yourself, love yourself like your pet does. Your, your pet or your three-year-old doesn't judge you, they accept you as you are. So, so do not postpone joy. Be kind to yourself and be kind to others. And as Jill was saying, one of the best ways to reduce your, your own stress is to start helping others. When you're helping others, you feel good about yourself. I, I think that that's so important to be kind to yourself and one of the quotes that I just love is, be kind because everybody you meet is fighting a tough battle. And in our practices, we have the great privilege of hearing so often exactly what those battles are. And they're so often heartbreaking. Um, people carry terribly heavy burdens. and. Um, so often they will tell me that you know somebody else has it worse and I hate to hear that because that's their way of trying to minimize what they're going through so be kind to yourself be kind to other people take that breath and breathe it's it's a very valuable thing and we'll be right back after this
Ready to quit? Great, we're ready to help. Call the quit line to set up a quit date. Takes about 15 minutes. Next time we talk, we'll review free medications, triggers, coping, withdrawal. Takes about 30 minutes. Check in for two more support calls and we'll go over challenges, how to handle slips. And don't worry, if you're stressed or things get rough, just call. Then, bam, you're tobacco free. So take a deep breath. You can do this. Stress. We have all felt it at one time or another. While it is universal, it is something that is almost impossible to generalize since it is also so personal. What stresses one person may be of no concern to someone else. There are countless self-help books and magazine articles talking about ways to banish stress from our lives. Stress is often portrayed as something we do not want or need in our lives. Often people see stress as a sign that they have failed at something or that they are too weak to handle a situation. Many people have unrealistic beliefs that if we could just control everything and make it just so, that stress would magically be banished from their lives. Stress is simply a force being exerted. It can be outside pressures from home, work, or family. It can be internal pressures that one places on themselves to measure up to an often unobtainable intrinsic standard or set of expectations. What if stress is not 100% bad? What if it could be used as a tool that makes us look around and see what is working and what is not working in our lives? Let stress be a call to action to help force us to make hard decisions and prioritize our life. When we stop running from the stress and turn and face it, we can then study it, and we may be able to learn from it. After all, a diamond is just a piece of coal that withstood an immense amount of stress incredibly well. Sometimes we just need a little pressure to give us the courage to change into something even better than we could have ever imagined. This brings us to the end of our show this evening. I sincerely thank our fantastic guests tonight, Dr. Jill Cruz and Dr. Amit Sood, for their insight into this important subject. The takeaway for tonight is that stress is present in all of our lives, but how we react to it and what we are able to do when it begins to overwhelm us makes a significant difference. If you feel that your life is being affected by too much by stress, visit with your doctor about the options you may have. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, be well. and joints and muscles and how they work together and what can be done when they stop working or are injured. We examine orthopedics next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by the Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy. Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Dakota Dermatology, the Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Community, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning on call with the Prairie Doc is provided by the generous support of Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishbach Financial Corporation.